One more clap for me and help me welcome everyone watching us via live stream, our e-church around the world. Welcome to church. <clears throat> Almost as many people, if not more, than those seated here watch us live. Uh, and that is a wonderful thing from everywhere in the world. Uh, and then I get the privilege of inviting up onto the stage in a moment, Pastor Ray Bevan. Uh, I... Um, uh, I am I, I, confident that you will agree that he is one of the most powerful voices uh, in the world right now, especially concerning the gospel of grace. Now, it's funny that I should say that as if there is an alternative, but unfortunately, some people were sold on the fake stuff, and so we have to explain it. And Pastor Ray is one of my inspirations, particularly in that space in regards to being an inspiration, I shared the story with him this morning that he and I actually met probably 20-something years ago. He just can't remember because I was one of many in a crowd. But I was at Rama Celebration, which is a massive event that takes place next week again, and Pastor Ray is a speaker there. And he had invited people to come forward if you felt called to ministry. I was one of the people in the front row of that invitation. I didn't listen carefully. I didn't realize he was going to pray for different categories of people. And the first category was, if you want to reach gangsters and drug dealers and pimps and prostitutes, you come forward. And so I came forward for that prayer. <laughs> so here you are. And then here, I, I don't know. I, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. That was low-hanging fruit as far as humor is concerned. It was unavoidable axia, a skis. That's become a new word yet, Father's house, a skis. Uh, but he then prayed on for various, and then I followed him, uh, the very thing you don't want uh, guests to do at a conference, all the way to the bookstore, and I cornered him and said, would you pray for me that it wouldn't only be one group of people, but every group of people, uh, from, from presidents all the way down to ordinary people, and... Uh, he laid hands on me and prayed for me 20 years ago, uh, and um, uh, that was an amazing uh, testimony. To now have him uh, in the front row of a church I get to pastor and invite him onto a stage, I believe, Ray, that you are part of the seed sowing for the fruit of what we see here today, and I thank you for your obedience. Ray has merchandise. Uh, flash drive on the gospel of grace, 10 hours of teaching for 200 rand, you absolutely should get it. Uh, he also has other resources which will be available at the merchandise store where he will be after the service to greet you personally and sign for things and maybe pray for a young man who will pass through a church of thousands someday. You don't know what could happen in the merchandise store. Don't judge it. Don't judge it. Amen. All those things are possible and I want to encourage you uh, to get along to that. Pastor Ray pastored a church for over 25 years, handed it over four years ago, was in a rock band, and is an excellent singer. He doubles up sometimes as Phil Collins. <laughs> and uh, not Kylie Minogue, but <laughs> don't ruin too many dreams in one moment, Pastor Ray. Uh, but um, he's staying at the Paxton Hotel, friends and uh, members of our church here, and uh, Somehow between yesterday and this morning, he managed to baptize someone at the Paxton Hotel pool as he led them to that. I mean, it's going to be one of those days in church. Would you please help me welcome Pastor Ray Bevan, everybody. Can I have a music, a mark stand, please? Come on, give it up for your pastor. This guy, come on, he is absolutely awesome, isn't he? Thank you, man. Come on, give Jesus a big clap in the house, somebody. When the road gets dark, you can no longer see. Let my love Spy. Have a little faith in me And when the tears you cry Oh, you can't believe Listen 
Give these loving arms a try Have a little faith in me Have a little faith in me This is Jesus speaking to your heart Have some faith in me Have a little faith in me Have a little faith Your secret heart cannot speak so easily. Listen, come here, darling, from a whisper star. Have a little faith in me. And when your back's against the wall, turn around and you. I catch you when you fall <laughs> Have a little faith Come on somebody Do you believe in Jesus? Have a little faith in me Have a little faith in me Have a little faith in me Yeah Have a little faith in me, yeah. faith in me. Just a little thing Eternity is our friend Cause it has no end Come on, come on and have it Say just a little thing I will always love you Never let you go, no Come on, beloved And have some faith Just a little thing I will always be by your side Just a little thing You're my precious one The apple of my eye Come on, come on and have faith in me Give it up for Jesus, somebody Yeah, praise Him, praise Him, go ahead Somebody praise Him in this place Father, thank you for the presence. Thank you for your presence here. Anything can happen today, Father, because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and everybody shout with me, and forever. Give the Lord another clap, somebody, and just praise him here. <laughs> it's an absolute privilege to be here, and when your pastor shared that story, when I laid hands on him over 20 odd years ago, you know what? You do not know how your life is affecting somebody else. And just uh, over the weekend, as Pastor George mentioned, I uh, checked in at the hotel and I was sitting down just chatting with a family I met there and, and uh, ended up this morning at seven o'clock baptizing one of the family, a lady, in the swimming pool with all the people having breakfast, looking through the window, wondering what was going on. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, there was an Old Testament law concerning worship. God said to his people, when you come into my presence from the east gate, you have to leave through the west gate. If you come into my presence from the north gate, then you have to leave through the south gate. The lesson, you don't leave God's presence the same way that you came into God's presence. And if that is the case, if that is the case under the old covenant, how much more under the new covenant? If you came in here depressed today, you're going to leave with the joy of the Lord flooding your heart. If you came in here sick, 
I believe in Jesus' name. If we raise our expectation, I believe, I don't care what sickness is ravaging your body right now. As I'm preaching and you believing, you can walk out of this place healed in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm Ray Bevan. I'm a Welshman. I'm a hobbit from the Shire. And I'm here. And uh, I... uh, I'm 33 years of age, and uh, no, 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 let me tell you the story. Let me, I'm sitting in the back garden with my granddaughter, uh, and she, then she was, um, she was five. And we were sitting in the back garden just talking about the problems in the Middle East and how to solve these problems. And you can get more sense from a child sometimes. Come on, somebody. And, and she, 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 said, she looked at me, and she says, Bampa, how old are you, Bampa? Now, this was like uh, four years ago, three, four years ago, uh, and I said, I'm 65, Eva. In fact, I'm 69 next Sunday, so I'm still going strong. So she, she looked at me and said, I, I'm, I'm 65, and she starts crying. <laughs> I mean, hysterical. So I'm trying to calm her down and say, Eva, why are you crying? She says, Bamba, I don't want you to die, Bamba. I thought, is this kid prophesying now? Because it happens. I said, Lord. I I said, I'm not going to die either, but Bampa, you will be 100 soon. (laughs) And everybody dies when they're 100. And then all of a sudden, this look of wonder came across her face. Like, you know, when Elliot saw E.T. for the first time. This this look of wonder. And I I said, Eva, what's happening? She says, Bampa. I know what to do. I said, what are you going to do? She said, I'm going to make you 30. (laughs) I said, how are you going to make me 30? She said, fairy dust. I said, fairy dust? Where where do you get the fairy dust from? Bampa, are you stupid? Tinkerbell. (laughs) Of course, I should have known. I said, where did you get the fairy? Well, the tooth fairy came last night and left some money under my pillow and also left me some magic fairy dust and I'm going to throw it over you, Bampa, and you're going to become 30. I said, how much fairy dust do you have? It's going to take a little bit of stuff here. Are you ready? I said, I'm ready. She threw it over me and I went with it. I went, oh, Eva, I'm losing my, my, I can't breathe. What's happening to me, Eva? She says, don't fight it, Bumper. Don't, f- <laughs> don't fight it. I said, okay. It's like electricity. Yeah, yeah. And I, I said, wow, what's just happened? Bumper, you are now 30. <laughs> and she went off and played with the dolls. Come on, give it up for my granddaughter. Absolutely awesome. And I'm driving to the school just, uh, just uh, last year, and she kept staring at me in the car. I said, what's wrong, Eva? She says, Bumper, I think it's wearing off. <laughs> she sent me a birthday card the year after. Happy 31st birthday, Bumper. She believes it. She believes it. And you know, when my granddaughter walked away, the Holy Ghost said, Why can't you be like that with me? Because unless you become like a little child, the deepest secrets of my kingdom will be, you will not be able to grasp them. And and, and I looked and and I thought, she lives in a world of wonder. She lives in a world where golden, where pumpkins become golden carriages. She lives in a world where wooden boys become real boys. She lives in a world world where magic mirrors speak. She lives in a world of wonder. And you know what the Holy Ghost said to me? Ray, I brought you into something that is amazing and wonderful. But, but, But he said to me, Ray, never lose the wonder of the gospel of the grace of God in your life. Never lose the wonder in the power of the gospel to change people's lives. Come on, somebody. Never lose the wonder of it. Never lose the wonder of it. And I believe one of the main things that's robbed the church of the wonder of grace is religion. 
And when I talk about religion, I'm not talking about some organization. I'm talking about a principle. And the principle of religion is any attempt that we make to be made right with God or any spiritual discipline we think maintains it. We are here by the grace of God and by the grace of God alone. We are saved by grace, kept by grace, blessed by grace. Do I have some believers in the house right here? And this revelation, this rev I pastored the same church for 25 years, and I handed the church over about four years ago, and, and, I, and I, I didn't know, you know, I, I, he, said, he said, Ray, it's time to hand over the church to the next generation. I said, excuse me, Lord, no offense, but I'm still in this generation, do you know what I'm saying? I'm still pretty cool, you know what I mean? So, no, he said, no, Ray, he said, listen, he said, not only are you setting in a sun, today, but the church is sending out a father. And he said, I, I said, Lord, I just don't want to fill a diary. He said, no. He said, there's a fresh mandate on your life. He said, I'm sending you out into my church as an abolitionist. I had to check in the diary what that meant. And I discovered that an abolitionist is someone who delivers somebody else from slavery. And he said to me, the biggest form of slavery on planet earth today, he said, is in my church. He said, watch this, my people are worshiping me in chains. And he said, armed with the gospel of grace alone, you are going to see chains fall off my people and they're going to enter into the world of the wonder of grace that their hearts desired for years. And I, yeah, give Jesus some praise right here. Is this helping anybody here? I'm going somewhere with this. Because, because religion is man respecting God. Christianity is man receiving God. Religion needs two elements to thrive in a person's life. First of all, you need an angry God. Secondly, you need a guilty conscience. So when you have an angry God with a guilty conscience, you will never live the abundant life that Jesus has for you. But that's what religion does. That's why, that's why religion is so effective and so powerful. Because it tells us that God is angry with you and you can never please him. Come on, somebody say amen right here. And, and I want to focus on something particular this morning. Uh, because I believe that Chains need to be broken in a certain area of people's lives today. And uh, I, I, I just feel it so strongly upon my heart. And um, I'm just going to make this statement and then clarify it. You see, religion will count you out. But grace will keep on counting. Imagine this. It's a boxing match. In the ring is a Christian working out her destiny. She's fighting the devil in the ring and smacking him all around the ring. She's doing great. The audience compiles of 10,000 Christians cheering her on. Come on, Christian, give him one for me. And she's smashing the devil. And then for one brief moment, she got distracted. And the devil caught her under the chin and smashed her down on the canvas. The crowd went silent. The referee began the count. One, two, three, four, five. The crowd stood up on their feet screaming, Get up, Christian! You can't let the devil beat you now. Come on, get up! No movement. The referee carried on counting. Six, seven, eight, nine. The devil stood on the bottom rope, ready to punch the air in victory and sneer at the crowd. She's still on the floor. There's no movement. And the referee counts 10. The crowd go deathly silent. And the devil screams at them and says, hey, easy, next. Then all of a sudden, a, a shock of horror went through his whole being as he heard the referee from the other side of the, of the ring, say, 11, 12, 13. Come on, help me, somebody. 14, 15, 
16, 17. The devil runs over to the referee who happens to be called Grace. And he screams in the face of Grace and says, That's not fair! <laughs> and Grace says, Yeah, I know it's not fair to you, but I am going to keep on counting till my servant gets up off the canvas and finish what I started in her life. Somebody better give praise to Jesus in this place right here. Hallelujah! <coughs> and uh, that's where some of you are. You're on the canvas. I don't know what's happened. But you've somehow the devil has caught you under the chin, smashed you on the floor, and religion and people and even yourself has counted yourself out. Now I want to tell you, Grace stands here this morning and he will keep on counting until you get up. And I believe this morning is the morning you're going to get up from that blow that put you down on the canvas. Somebody help me here. And you're going to finish. And, and the blow, the knockout blow that smashed you on the canvas is disappointment. Disappointment. Some of you are disappointed with yourself. Some of you believe that you have behaved your way out of God's love. Let me tell you something. You couldn't behave your way into it, and you're certainly not going to behave your way out of it. When the angel of death passed through the streets of Egypt, when the angel of death passed through the streets of Egypt, God gave the angel of death one command. When you see the blood on the doorpost of the house, it will tell you that the people inside have trusted my sacrifice for their safety, for their salvation. So he said, when you see the blood, that means the people have exercised their faith in my command to trust my sacrifice for them. When you see the blood, then you pass by. The angel of death came to a house and saw the blood. He didn't say to himself, no, this is too easy. I need to go inside first and check out if they've been good Christians all week. I want to go inside first and check out if they're up to the standard. I want to go inside first and check their behavior. God says, no, when you see the blood, you pass over them. And I'm telling you, the basis of our righteousness, as you know. I know this morning I'm just teaching ducks to quack. But it's good to remind ourselves that we are saved by the blood of Jesus, kept by his grace. Come on, somebody. Say amen. But some of you, some of you believe you behaved your way out. And you know, imagine this. I love illustrations and stories. Imagine it's like the, the, the ice skating final in the Olympics, right? The last skater is ready to go out onto the ice. He's rehearsed his routine for four years. He's got it off perfect. His name is announced. He goes out onto the ice and starts skating. He's doing great. And then halfway through the routine... Something doesn't feel right inside. And he, he, his double lutz looks like a starfish on speed. And he comes down and he, and he twists and he falls and, and, and he gets up and he skates again and another jump and he falls. And in his heart he's saying, I didn't rehearse this. I didn't plan for this. But it was going wrong. The last jump he comes down messes up, sits on the ice, waiting for the judges to give the score. The Russian judge, zero. The South African judge, zero. And then a very good-looking Welsh judge <laughs> stood up and looked at this guy who had tried his best, but it just didn't work out. And the Welsh judge said, nine out of ten. The other judge says, are you on drugs or something? How can you give a mark like that for a performance like that? And the Welsh judge looked compassionately at the skater and said, well, it's awful slippery out there, isn't it? <laughs> Come on, somebody, let that sink in right here. It's awful slippery out there. Don't you think God knows it's awful slippery out there as you're trying to build your marriage? Don't, don't you know God knows it's awful slippery out there as you're trying to serve Jesus? 
Don't you know? Come on, somebody. I want to tell you, God gives you a score that you don't deserve. That's what grace does. But I really feel, I really feel that there's, there's many of you here, and we're going to pray for people in this area. Many of you are not just disappointed with yourself, but many of you, um, something has happened in your life. It could be recently or it could be months ago or even years ago. And some of you may be disappointed with people. You've been knocked on the canvas. Somebody here, and there may be many, some of you have been knocked out by unfair treatment. It's unfair what's been done to you. It's unfair, it's unjust what's been said to you. Here's the problem. Christianity would be easy if it wasn't for our humanity. And very often, the problem is not spiritual, it's emotional. And some of you are here and you've been knocked out by disappointment and you can't deal with it emotionally. Well, you know what? Listen, you don't fight spiritual battles with emotional weapons. Come on, somebody, talk to me here. And some of you are trying to deal with the emotions that have come as a result of unfair treatment, bitterness and anger and, and, and resentment and this stuff, and you can't stop them. And, and the devil jumps on that and makes you feel guilty for being human and for experiencing all this stuff. But you don't know how to, how to deal with it. Well, grace taught me how to deal with unfair treatment. And I remember going through a season when it was unfair. And many times I've just wanted to give up the ministry, give up. Because the, I think that the greatest heartache of our lives is disappointment with people. Can I hear an amen here? And, uh, and when I was going through, through this and I, I, I just wanted revenge, I wanted, there was resentment rising up in me and I didn't like it. And I, I knew I had to guard my heart because out of my heart flow the issues of life and, and, and it caught me by surprise. And I, I've been a Christian for years and I'm thinking, what's going on? How, how can I deal with this, Lord? And, and the Lord showed me this scripture in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23. I don't think any one of us, I think every single one of us actually could agree with me that the, that the greatest unfair treatment that ever has happened is when they nail Jesus to the cross. And Peter is writing and he says, this is how you deal with it. He said, here's the example. And, and Peter's relating to how Jesus responded to unfair treatment, and this is what he says, he didn't retaliate when insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. Now watch this. This blew me away. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. Wow. It exploded in me. And the Lord shared with me and said, Ray, never respond to unfair treatment emotionally, but always respond revelationally. And I, I just feel there are people here, the reason, and I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not coming up here and saying, well, six steps to freedom. No, man, let's, let's get real here. And, and, um, and um, the reason why trusting God in this way is so hard is because uh, our emotions and reason hate the consequences of trusting God. The consequences of trusting God when you're unfairly treated, the consequence in your emotions is the feeling of vulnerability. We don't like feeling vulnerable, but that's the cost of trusting God. Come on, somebody say amen. Trusting God is not some theological statement. It's something that we do. And, 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 and this is what some of you are going to do. I remember, 
uh, uh, there, there were lies on the internet about me for years, blatant lies. And when I read them, I, want, I, I knew the guy who was doing it, and I just wanted to share something with him to tell him how I disagreed with what he was saying. So, so I'm mad. I'm angry. I want to rip this guy's head off. I said, and, and I'm, I'm going to ring him, and I'm, I'm gonna, this is not fair. This is lies. And the Lord said, leave it. Yeah, leave it. But it's lies, Jesus. What will people think? Leave it. I left it for six years. And then after six years, the Holy Ghost said to me, it's time to ring the guy now and tell him about these lies. I said, but I don't care anymore. He said, job done. Come on, somebody. I don't care anymore. But he said, no, you see, see, Ray, you were concerned about your reputation. You were concerned about what people think about you. Now you don't care. Now you're concerned about if he can lie about you, he can lie about somebody else. So sort him out. I did. I sort him out. I, do you know what? I went on the phone. Within 24 hours, that lion article was taken off the internet. But even better than that, something in my character had grown. I'd learned how, by the grace of God. Do you know what the Lord said to me during this season? Hey, Ray, stay on the cross. It's safer there. They asked me to prove myself too. Hey, Jesus, you are the Son of God. Come on then. Let's see you come off the cross. He surrendered his case into the hands of God who judges fairly. You can't get more vulnerable than this. Come on, is this helping anybody right here? Come on, Jesus, you're the Messiah, you're the Messiah. No, 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 Ray, Ray stay on the cross. They asked me to prove myself too. Stay on the cross, it's safer there. These lessons you learn when you go through this stuff. And you know, what he, that, another thing he said to me, he said, Ray, you know, I'm not really concerned how you respond to Palm Sunday praise. I want to see how you react to Good Friday's nails. We preach the same message from the cross as from the donkey. Come on, somebody. Whether people are praising you or people are slandering you, we remain the same. We stay with the program. Come on, somebody say amen right here. I'm preaching myself very happy. Be still and know that I am God. The actual translation of that verse, we think of be still. It means like this. No, the actual translation is be quiet. And let go. Revenge gives the person who hurt you importance. Forgiveness makes them obsolete. And, and today, uh, right now, uh, as we come to a close, we've got, a, we've got about nine minutes left. And I, I, I just, uh, this is the rhema word. This is how we are going to do this. The Holy Ghost has told me to tell those of you that are suffering the emotional response and reaction of being unfairly treated. He said, tell the people it's time to surrender. It's time to surrender control of an out-of-control situation. Will you feel vulnerable? Yes. <laughs> but you know what? You will enter into another realm. When you you'll sing the song of Ilsa. Let it go, let it go. We all know it. And many of you are going to sing the song. The answer is not psyching yourself up emotionally to try and deal with this. The answer is letting go. The answer is surrendering control of an out. You've tried to control it emotionally, circumstantially, mentally, scripturally. Listen, God has sent this little hobbit from the Shire to tell you it's time to let it go.
You know, I, I, I'm gonna, I, I want a keyboard player to come right now and play the drums. Um, no, it was a joke. <laughs> Probably could. You, have you received this this morning here? Now, this is, I want to be very practical now because we are gonna, we are gonna demolish, we are gonna break this chain that, that's kept you chained with this unfair treatment, and we're gonna, and I'm gonna show you the spiritual weapon that's gonna pull down this stronghold. It's very simple. I remember not so long ago, um, the attack was vicious on my life. I wanted to give up the ministry again. <laughs> this is encouraging for people that want to go into the ministry, isn't it? I'm being honest with you. I'd had enough of people. I wanted every, do you know, the church would be great if it wasn't for people. So, but that's not my problem. So anyway, so I, I said, I said, look, I'm driving up to the airport. I'm driving up to the airport, George, and I'm, and I'm going through all these emotions. You know, as a pastor does, Lord, can I just, 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 just one and then forgive me after, you know, I'm just. And, and driving, I'm on all these emotions, like resentment and, and revenge and, and, and anger. And I hated these, and I, I couldn't stop them. And I'm coming up to the airport, and, and I, 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 you know, when you go to an airport, I mean, like Heathrow is very busy, and it was just going a little bit dark, and, and I saw these planes lined up. You know, they line up to land. You can see the lights. They lined up one after the other. And I said, Lord, that's my heart. Resentment is, is coming in to land. And then when that lands, there's anger coming behind that one. And then when that's, there's jealousy coming behind that one. I said, Lord, shoot the planes down. Shoot these planes down that are trying to land on my heart. Do you know what he said to me? No. He said, I'm not going to shoot the planes down. I want you to flood the airport. Come on, somebody. I said, what? Flood the airport. He said, <laughs> he said, the devil's plane of resentment cannot land on a forgiveness covered runway. He said, watch this. He said, the devil's plane of fear cannot land with a trust covered runway. He said, the plane of bitterness cannot land on a love-covered runway. He said, the plane of guilt cannot land on a grace-covered runway. He said, he said, Ray, you can't stop the planes arriving, but I have provided you with the means to close down the airport so that these planes cannot land on the runways of your heart. Come on, somebody, say amen. Give the Lord some praise in this house right here. And that's what we're going to do. What you're going to do, you're going to flood the runway. And when the devil comes in with resentment to land, he says, can't land there. He'll circle and go somewhere else. Say, so how are you going to flood the airport? Do you know what? Jesus, I mentioned it, Jesus did not fight emotional battles with emotional weapons. He was human. He, he, felt, he felt the pain of betrayal. I mean, he spent three years pouring his life into Judas. Three years. How can you wash an enemy's feet? Because you don't fight Emotional battles with emotional weapons. And you know what this got to me? This got to me. It says of this, it says this, Jesus kept his heart flooded. He kept his heart soaked with the presence of God. And it's very simple. I love this. There's one scripture because, I, I, you know, many of us have experienced betrayal at a high level. It's part of life. You can't run away from it. It'll happen. It's how do you deal with it? And there's one verse that got to me. You're going to love it. It says this. In the same night, 
that he was betrayed, he gave thanks. That's wild. He didn't, he didn't give thanks for the betrayal. He gave thanks to his father because he says, no, he, Jesus knew. You know what he said on one occasion? No one comes into my life unless my father knows about it. No one can come into my life unless my father has either, has either ordained it, orchestrated it, or just allowed it. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. But here's the answer. Here's the answer. Jesus flooded his heart with thanksgiving and praise and worship. He just left his case in the hands of God who judges fairly. Thank you, Lord Jesus. What I'm going to do, I want every head bowed right here. I'm going to hand back to the pastor in just a moment to make an appeal for salvation. But I want to speak to people who this message has spoken to. I'm, I'm, I'm very simple. I'm going to help you here. Very simple. You're going to let it go by faith. And you're going to give thanks by faith. And, and from this moment on, you're going to continue to give thanks by faith and keep your heart flooded. Keep it soaked so that the devil cannot land his plane on your life. I'm going to count to three. And if you say, Ray, I'm going to let it go. I'm going to surrender control of this out of control situation. It could be relational, financial, circumstantial. I don't know what it is, but you've been trying to manage it. And it's not work. No, you need to do this. You need to surrender. Surrender control. Just stay focused. Stay focused. Surrender control of an out of control situation. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, somebody. Just praise the Lord for a moment. Just thank Him. Just give God praise. Give God praise. Give God praise. Somebody give God praise in this house right here. That's okay. It's all right. God is helping people. Now, what I want you to do, when I count to three, I want, I want, if this message is related to you and you're going to surrender control, when I count to three, I want you to stand to your feet and we're going to say a simple prayer. George mentioned today, I didn't know, George, that a simple prayer in a bookshop would result in this. And I don't know why this simple prayer right now, I don't know. It's not just your life that's at stake, but it's many others. So, one, two, three. Stand up where you are, if this is relevant to you. Wow. Wow. Close your eyes. Now, I want you to put out your right hand in front of you like this. If you can just do this. Sometimes Jesus did physical things to explain spiritual things. I want you to look into your hand and I want you, by faith now, forget the person next to you, by faith, I want you to put in your hand the, what you're going to let go of. It could be some pain from the past. It could, yeah, put her in too. Yeah, put him in. Yeah, put that abortion in. Yeah, put that attempted suicide in. that death in that you keep asking why put it in we're going to let it go right, make a fist around that stuff and then when I count to three I want you to raise your hand up and let it go and then we're going to raise your other hand and you're going to worship okay one two three raise it up let it go raise your other hand and start to praise the Lord Come on, start to worship. My God, people are being set free all over the place. Come on, can I hear some thanksgiving in this place? Come on, thank him. Sing your own song. Lock in, lock in. Come on, just thank him. I don't care if you feel like it or not. Do it by faith. Thank him. Flood the airport. Flood the runways. Flood it. Flood it. 
Rapotasta Sambro Tekedebesa. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, as your people are giving thanks, you're flooding their hearts. You're flooding their hearts. Lord, we bless you. We thank you. We give you praise. And we give you thanks. And everybody said, Amen. Now give the Lord the biggest clap that you It, it's, would you give me a moment? It's, it remains standing. It's seldom that in a whole house at one time so much raw emotion is, is touched by the hand of God. And I can see people both in celebration and in tears across this sanctuary. And I think we give God thanks for that. Amen. We give God thanks for that. I feel like this is the moment I want to, I want to end the service on. I feel like this is the, the power moment in so many ways. If you're not in a relationship with Jesus and want to start one, come to the front and have a conversation. There are prayer people in front at the end of every service. Also in the middle near the sound desk and communion available every Sunday. And when things like that happen, we're well equipped for it. It's both in the Bible and in our sphere of capacity as a church. Never be unnerved by it. It's to be expected more and more as God moves in and among us. Uh, Pastor Ray will be at um, Warehouse One. He sings too, by the way. Rather well, I thought. He's got a singing album too, I found out. I just managed to steal one from him. But you might want to grab that. Can I release you with God's blessing? Invite you to stick around for a cup of coffee. Go to the Welcome Lounge or come forward for prayer and look forward to seeing you. Either tonight where Pastor Ray will be ministering another word or next week. Thank you and God bless you everybody.